Let's go ahead and see how to run USB power delivery compliance tests on the Dell UltraSharp U3219Q monitor. We'll go ahead and pull up the C2 compliance software, which has already been installed on this Dell Precision PC. It's coming up right now. Now this is the main uh, software which we'll use to run all the USB power delivery uh, compliance tests on the monitor. We'll first go ahead and make sure we set up the correct Ethernet connection. The best way to do that is to just type in uh, Ethernet in the uh, search bar in Windows. You can then select the change adapter options and if you click on the uh, properties for the Ethernet network and then uh, double click on the TCP IP v4 properties, uh, we can go ahead and just set the IP address of the PC to be on the same subnet as the C2 that's connected to it. So we will just go ahead and input 192.168. Dot two five five dot two. The C two default IP is one nine two dot one six eight dot two five five dot one. So they should be able to talk to each other directly through this setting. I'll go ahead and hit OK in these uh, windows. And if you like, you, know, you can always verify through the command prompt through a simple ping to make sure that you can communicate find to the C2 that's uh, connected to the PC directly over the Ethernet cable. Okay, so it looks like we got a reply, so that's good. Uh, so we'll just go back to the C2 software and use the default IP. Again, the C2 IP address is 192.168.255.1. I'll go ahead and connect refresh. And this establishes the connection between the software and the C2. You can see that the connection has been successful and it reads the latest versions of the firmware eload. And uh, if there is a mismatch between what the software is expecting versus what uh, versions of the uh, firmware and eload exists on the C2, they'll, they'll give you a warning on how to update that firmware. But in this case, everything's good. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, continue. Uh, we've attached a GRL SPL cable, which is the blue cable that comes with the C2. Uh, we've used that to directly connect between port one of the C2 to the Dell monitor, uh, Dell monitor's type C port. And we will, we don't have the VIF for the, uh, for the monitor. So we'll just go ahead and uh, select the type of device from a power delivery standpoint the, the monitor is. In this case, the, uh, the monitor is typically providing a power to the, uh, to the PC that's connected to it. It typically doesn't uh, consume power that's done through an external AC power adapter. So we'll go ahead and select provider only and uh, we'll just want to make sure that there's connection uh, and communication going on between the PC and the C2. So we'll go ahead and click Read Capabilities on port 1. So right now what the C2 is doing is it's sending a bunch of uh, queries to the monitor and checking for its identity, uh, checking to see what sort of uh, SVIDs it supports, and also checks for things like um, alt mode uh, type of support. Uh, once that information is uh, read, you'll be able to see that here. Up here it popped up. So you can see that the, the monitor replied this identification as a Dell uh, device. And anything that uh, we could read from its response uh, to us uh, with regards to the spec, such as it supports uh, modal operations uh, alt mode, which is true. It supports the DisplayPort alt mode. 
the official USB VID uh, PID um, of this product, uh, all that's uh, here. And uh, it also includes information about what SVIDs are supported, as well as the, the source PDOs. In this case, there are four PDOs, power delivery objects supported. Uh, 5 volts, 3 amps. The second one is 9 volts, 3 amps. You also have 15 volts, 3 amps, and 20 volts, 4.5 amps. Which makes sense given the the Dell PCs uh, tend to support um, at least 90 watts of uh, power on their Type C port. Okay, so now that communication is is done, uh, you can go ahead if you wanted to use this information to generate a VIF. You can you can go ahead and do that. This provides you a, a vendor info file that you can load back into the official USBIF tool to generate VIFs. This is sort of a, sort of a shortcut you can use to uh, make it easier to generate a VIF based on the actual device's capabilities. If you actually did have a VIF, uh, you could import it here, and then again, you could read the capabilities and compare if there's any discrepancies between the, the VIF information and the device information. Note the, 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 the VIF is uh, typically used to help the, the test tools determine what tests to run on the device. Uh, so we'll just continue along and uh, even though we don't, uh, we haven't loaded the VIF, we know that um, some tests uh, won't be able to be run, but uh, I think that's okay just to see how the tests are, are conducted. Quite a lot of tests can be run without the VIF. So for example, in the PD communications engine test, uh, we'll just go ahead and keep the default uh, values here, including a two-tone noise, which uh, mimics a noise uh, imparted from an adjacent uh, data line onto the uh, CC line. Uh, we'll use that in the uh, RX, electrical RX tests, Phi RX tests, which are here. And uh, running these communication engine tests is as simple as just clicking the top button here. It automatically collects, selects all the sub uh, tests, which include physical layer tests, the protocol tests, as well as the power tests. This is generally a good uh, overall test to run uh, to just check for the different layers of communication, the physical layer, the protocol layer, and then the, the power application layer. Uh, some of the other tests just tend to focus on um, one, or, one or two uh, specific layers. So after selecting all these tests, we can hit play. The VIF was not uh, entered in, but we'll go ahead and accept that. And a advanced plotter window comes up and this gives you a view of what's happening live in terms of the communication between the C2 and the Dell monitor. We can see up here in the advanced plotter, these are all the PD uh, communications. Blue means uh, tester sending a message and D means DUT, or in this case it's the Dell monitor sending a message. And you can see how that matches up with the uh, signal uh, waveforms. What, whatever is appropriate signal waveform that is uh, useful in the test is uh, brought up here in the bottom. So it's easy to, to see what's going on um, from both a uh, communication standpoint as well as a, a signal standpoint. As these uh, tests are running, you can have a, a live view on uh, how the tests are faring. Uh, if you want to check to see how the tests are um, are going uh, while the tests are running, after a test has been test item has been completed, you can just click on it, and you can see the uh, the test result for that specific item, and without waiting for you know, all the the tests to run, um, you can see that the, the eye diagrams here for the TX tests. Uh, passed, uh, we did have uh, five RX tests uh, fail. Uh, looks like we 
and some something happened there we can uh, explore uh, the failure in more uh, detail um, afterwards to see uh, what caused that particular uh, failure actually in this case we can see here we can see that the uh, in the once we selected the specific test we can see that uh, in, actually there was no good CRCs found so even though we sent uh, multiple BIST test data messages the uh, device did not send any good CRC so that, that's definitely not um, a good sign and so therefore a, a failure has been made typically we want to see that as these uh, BIST uh, test data messages are sent and the, no the sinusoidal noise is uh, injected we should be the, the device under test, in this case the Dell monitor, should be able to withstand that noise and um, and be able to send back a good CRC. In uh, this case we see uh, a failure here. Uh, so these tests continue to uh, to run and overall the communications engine test for source uh, should take maybe roughly about uh, within half an hour um, everything should be done. So we'll just go ahead and uh, let it run. And we'll come back once we get the final results and check to see how well the Dell monitor has passed uh, the PD compliance test for this uh, communication engine MOI. Now that the tests are done, we can go ahead and check the results. Here in the C2 software, we have a summary of all the pass-fail conditions for each of the different test items. We can see that the uh, TX test before passed, the RX items had failures because no good CRCs were returned. Uh, we can also take a look at the eye diagram generated from the TX tests. Everything looks good with good margin uh, versus the uh, the blue uh, mask areas, which is where the yellow waveform signal should not be touching. And let's see how everything else looks here. Uh, this looks like some uh, issues related to uh, the get cap messages and also some loading failures were seen um, as well. Looks like some uh, issues related to being able to uh, stay within certain uh, limits on the, on the voltage side and similar failures here seen on the power source transient tests. Now to save the results, we can go ahead and go to the last tab here. We can just go ahead and write the model name of the device. Again, this is the ultra sharp. U3219Q and you can just go ahead and save the results into the default folder. You can always change that folder if you need to. And in that folder, I can just open up that folder and I'll open up the HTML file that's there. And you can see a summary of uh, all the tests again, uh, which you can share with uh, with other people. It contains summaries of the DUT information, test setups, uh, whatever configurations are used in the tester, uh, the product capabilities, the vendor info file if that was loaded, and power capabilities, and as well as a high-level mapping of 
which tasks pass and which tasks have failed. So this is set up to be very hierarchical. So you can, if you wanted to dive in uh, deeper, you can, for example, click on this test. It will show this, uh, the uh, subtests associated with that test. And if you want to actually see the protocol trace associated with that as well, you can go here. Now, if you wanted to actually look at how all this looks from a deeper protocol standpoint, uh, you can go back and open up any of the waveform files that were sa uh, saved in the uh, in the report folder. So we'll just go to the C2 directory report and the last one we tested was here. And if you go to the waveform files, uh, every all the raw uh, waveforms are saved in this, these GRL trace folders. So you can go ahead and open up uh, any of these uh, these traces. And for example, I open up this one here. And the, the appropriate trace was is shown here. And the same thing for of these other ones here. If you wanted to dive in deeper into the specific, specific PD messages, you can select show uh, a selected PD message. And if you click on here, or any one of these uh, messages, you can uh, look in more uh, detail on uh, each of the uh, bit level information uh, for these messages. So that's useful for uh, debugging purposes. Even if you don't click the message, if you just want to have see more information about a particular item, you just go ahead and click on the uh, message here, and the information, detailed information about the, the message is automatically shown. So now we can go ahead and run other tests. Uh, other than communication engine tests, we can. Uh, there are PD3 tests, there are uh, deterministic uh, compliance tests. Why don't we go ahead and run the deterministic tests here? And again, we'll just go ahead and click run. And it should go ahead and automatically run through all the tests. And we'll go ahead and just let the test run just like before. Uh, again, it should take maybe about half an hour to an hour or two to run these, these tests. So we'll come back after it's done. The deterministic MOI test just finished, and again, we can go back to the compliance test results summary to see what passed and what failed for these various tests. And it uh, looks like, generally speaking, we had some good results. And again, we can just go ahead and um, always, while we're checking for the test, if you click on any of these high level tests, you can see uh, the appropriate uh, waveform that's associated with the test as well as the, uh, the power delivery uh, protocols. So all that's synchronized. And uh, again, just like before, we'll go ahead and just save these results. Down. I'll 
sharp. U3219 Q. And the deterministic type test is that label is already set. And again, we can generate the report. And like before, we can open the report and open the, H open the HTML file to look at the uh, results. And like before, all the setup information is saved up top. And then you can see the result summaries um, towards the middle and the detailed results at the bottom. In the results folder, you can also open up other formats. You can open up a CSV format if you like. A PDF format is also saved if that's more convenient for you, but generally the HTML format is uh, better uh, formatted. And uh, if you go into the folders, you can always see all the different um, detailed raw results and waveform files that can be pulled up at any time. So all this information is there in the report folder. If you plan to just share a high-level result, uh, we recommend just sending over the HTML file uh, that we saw earlier. And if, but if you want to send a uh, some information to help debug an issue, we recommend just going ahead and uh, zipping this entire report folder and uh, just send it to the appropriate team that is going to want to look at the raw waveform files to see uh, and, the, and the, the PD packet information to see what might be going on with some of the failures. So that's how we use the C2 compliance software to run uh, compliance tests. It's a very useful tool to run uh, most of the compliance tests required by the USB IF or USB power delivery. And uh, it's fully automated and uh, uh, a very uh, cost-effective tool to use. Mm -hmm.